Do I have to raise the dead this morning? Are you here this morning? Come on. All right. I'm excited for today's message. This is the last of our series, Liar, Lunatic, Lord, and I'm grateful that it's on Palm Sunday. And I know Pastor Chris reiterated, if you guys don't know what Palm Sunday is, it is the day that Jesus entered Jerusalem and people took palms and they waved it and put it on the ground. And, and for some, you know, some people don't understand why, you know, why a palm tree, right? But palm trees were used by the Jewish people for many different kinds of festivals. And in the festival, they would, it was a way of showing victory for God's people. It was a way of saying that we're triumphant, that we have a king, we have a, a lord or, or someone who's triumphant over their, over their enemies. And so when people saw Jesus coming because they had heard that he was the Messiah, people were excited. People were exuberant. They were saying, Hosanna, right, in the highest. And they were actually singing a psalm from Psalms 118 where they were laying out and saying, this is, this is our king. And this made people upset, of course. Some people did not like that because they did not believe that Jesus was the Messiah. But, but what we celebrate on Palm Sunday is that Jesus is the Messiah. He is the king of Israel, which means he's the king of the whole world. Let's go. Amen. And so we celebrate. That's why we do this, so that people are not weirded out by, you know, palms everywhere. And like, why do they have palm trees, right? Uh, it works for us in Florida because we have palms everywhere, right? But this is why we celebrate even for 2,000 years. This is what we are celebrating is not just palms. We're, we're celebrating that Jesus is king and that he's the Lord. And so I'm grateful this morning that we get to uh, end our series on this, on this point because our text today is directly connected to what follows Palm Sunday. And this text also follows from Palm Sunday where we left off when uh, the last message I was able to teach on, which was Jesus, the resurrection, and the life. And we're going through all the great I am's of Jesus because really what we're talking about through Jesus being a liar, a lunatic, or Lord is we're talking about that Jesus claimed to be God. And the way that he did that, there's numerous ways you could explain or, or explain that from Scripture. But what we're going through is the great I am's, the I am statements of Jesus. I want to read to you from a uh, famous Christian uh, in the early 19th century, Watchman Nee. He wrote a book called The Normal Christian Life. And it's powerful. If you ever get a chance to read it, I highly, again, one of those books that I recommend to people to read is The Normal Christian Life by Watchman Nee. And... Uh, what he, he teaches through this book is he says this. This is written in 1936, by the way, but he said this. A person who claims to be God must belong to one of the three categories, okay? First, if he claims to be God and yet, in fact, is not, he has to be a madman or a lunatic. Second, if he is neither God or a lunatic, he has to be a liar, deceiving others by this lie. Third, if he is neither of these, he must be God. So he says, you can only choose one of these three possibilities. If you do not believe that he is God, you have to consider him a madman. If you cannot take him for neither of the two, you have to take him for a liar. There is no need for us to prove if Jesus of Nazareth is God or not. Why? Because all we have to do is find out if he's a lunatic or a liar. If he is neither, he must be the son of God. And that's what we've been talking about going through our series. Is Jesus who he claims to be? Because there's the trilemma, as it's called, is that either Jesus is a madman, he's a lunatic for saying the kinds of things that he says and doing the kind of things that he's claimed to be doing. And I would go along with his disciples to also going along with the lunacy. Or he is the greatest liar in humanity, as far as I'm concerned. And what C.S. Lewis, Lewis talked about, the, the gr greater than the devil, because he deceived the whole world in thinking that he's God when, in fact, he would not be if he's not. Or if you can't, if you can't swallow that pill, then, then Jesus is just the Lord. That's the only conclusions you can take from Jesus' very own words. What we can't do is say that Jesus is a great teacher. He's a great guy. He, he, was, a good, he was a good spiritual teacher. Like, these are not, that's not an option for Jesus. Because when you read Jesus' words, you'll notice that he only has three reactions from people. Either, which happens a lot from people who already claim to know God, people hated him. Like, people literally hated Jesus. They hated on him. Jesus had haters, okay? There were Pharisees, Sadducees. There was all kinds of different kinds of haters, right? 
So Jesus had haters, and, and that's a natural response if you're hearing Jesus' words. That's a natural response. You would hate what he's saying. Or people were terrorized by Jesus' words. And I say that carefully because I don't want you to think that Jesus was trying to scare people, but you have to think what Jesus is saying, it would cause you to, to be a little like, whoa, that normal people don't speak like that. Jesus says some wild things. He's, he makes some wild claims about himself. So Jesus would, they would bring some terror in people's lives. Or the last response would be adoration. That, that people adored what Jesus was saying. They were sucked into him. They were like, whoa, you, what you're saying is amazing, is powerful, right? Those are the natural three responses to Jesus in, throughout the Bible. But at no point would, do, will you ever find Jesus speaking and then people were like, oh, that's cool. Like, you'll, never, you'll never find that. You'll never find people like, oh, yeah, that's good spiritual teaching. Thanks, I'll take that advice. Like Jesus never, whenever Jesus spoke, it was either like, People hated him for saying, and they wanted to stop him from talking. People were terrorized because they realized what he was saying, and they realized the implications of it, or they adored what he was saying. They were sucked into his words. Th those are the only natural responses to Jesus' words. I, I want us to look at this, our, last, our last text, our last I am. It is, I am the way, the truth, and the life. So if you want to turn to two places, John chapter 14, you could park it right there. And then if you want to make like a, a side note area, which we are going to read at the end, John chapter 5. So John chapter 5 and John chapter 14. And we're going to begin reading from verse 1 on chapter 14, okay? So if you have your Bible, I want you to read this with me. Do not let your hearts be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. I want to read that again. Jesus says, do not let your hearts be troubled. You believe in God. Believe also in me. Okay. I, don't, for, I want you to understand the wild statement Jesus just made. Jesus is claiming for his disciples to believe in him the same way that they would believe in God. Like the creator. So he's making this, think about this. We worship God by trusting him because we know he's not a liar. We know he doesn't make false promises. We know that we come from him. We know that we belong to him. We know that God has all supremacy, authority, that he is the one who made us. And Jesus is now saying, okay, guys, I know you believe in God. I'm saying to you now also believe in me. That statement by itself, I think, is enough to make the claim that Jesus is God because who can claim to want to be believed in at the same level as God if you are not God? So Jesus goes on, my father's house has many rooms. If that were not so, would I have told you that I'm going there to prepare a place for you? Verse 3, and if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to be with me so that you also may be, everybody say this, where I am. Where, say it to someone the umph in your voice. Everybody say, where I am. Okay. Jesus is saying to his disciples, hey, my father's house, it's got lots of space. It's, it's huge. You guys have never seen a mansion or house as big as my father's house. And I'm going there, and you're going to have your own special place in this house. And, like, why would I tell you that if Jesus is saying, why would I tell you guys that if, if it weren't true? And that, that I want, I'm, I'm saying this to you because I want you to know it's my father's house. I'm invited in my father's house, and I'm taking you with me so that you can know you'll be there with me. That's what Jesus is saying here. So he goes on, you know the way to the place where I'm going. So Jesus is saying all this, but I want to give some context to John chapter 14 because John chapter 14 is a part of the bigger dialogue that Jesus was having with his disciples in what's called the upper room. And the upper room is where Jesus walked into Jerusalem, we saw on Palm Sunday, and from there, he's going to a place where he's going to celebrate Passover with his disciples. So John chapters 13, 14, 15, 16, and 17 are literally the entire discussion that Jesus has with his disciples as he's telling them about communion, as he was telling them someone's going to betray me, where Peter says, 
oh, I'll never, I'll never deny you. And Jesus says, no, you're going to deny me three times, Peter. In fact, right before Jesus said this, he was talking in John chapter 14. This is how it goes. John chapter 13 says and begins saying, it was just before the Passover festival. Jesus knew that the hour had come for him to leave the world and go to the Father. So Jesus was leaving the world and going to the Father. I want you to key on to that. Having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. Then he goes on to verse 3. Jesus knew that the Father had given him authority over everything and that he had come from God and would return to God. Another verse that later on in John chapter 16, Jesus says, I came from the Father and entered the world. Now I'm leaving the world and going back to my Father. So let me help everybody else out with this real quick. Jesus is saying that he is from heaven. He is from eternity. He is from the Father. He's not like us who were born naturally and we're in this world. Like Jesus is talking about himself in a pre-existent state. I was with the Father, right? I came into the world because he sent me. Then he's saying, now that I've, he sent me, I've done what he wanted me to do, and now I'm going back to the Father, right? I don't, I don't know anyone in the world who talks like this for the record, but this is the context of what Jesus is talking about. So you could see how if the disciples were not fully understanding, they were kind of like, what, what is he talking about, right? You were from the Father, and you're going back to the Father, right? And so Jesus is, this is the context, and Jesus, before this point, he is in the, the Passover with his disciples. He begins to wash their feet. He washes all of his disciples' feet, and you guys have probably seen that, read that text before. Then he tells his disciples, someone's going to betray me. We know who that is. It's Judas. And th they're all wondering, they're all talking, who's, who's going to betray who, Right? And then, and then the disciples start saying, no, Jesus, we're, we got your back. We're going to lay our dives down for you no matter what happens. And Jesus tells the disciples, no, no you're not. No, you're not. You guys are all going to abandon me. And Peter, you're going to deny me three times. And twice you'll hear the rooster crow and you're going to deny me again. It's in that moment of them being frustrated of realizing, no, Jesus, we told you we're going to go with you. And then Jesus says, no, you're not. But then he says, but listen, I, I don't want you to be troubled. If you believe in God, believe also in me. And now he starts giving them promises like, hey, I know you're going to deny me, but, but understand, it's okay. Because I'm going to my father, and I'm, I'm going for you. I'm going to prepare a place for you, dude. I want you to know that, that I'm not going just to leave you. I'm going to do something for you that only I can do. Because it's my father's house. And this is the context to where we see. Now I want you to go back to John chapter 14, verse 5. Thomas said to him, so Jesus says, you know the way of where I'm going. And then Thomas said to him, Lord, we don't know where you're going. So how can we know the way? Jesus answered, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the father except through me. If you really know me, you will know my father as well. From now on, you do know him and have seen him. And so Jesus answered Thomas, who, when Jesus just told him where he was going, he's like, we don't know where you're going. And how are we supposed to know the way? And Jesus says, listen, Thomas, I am the way. I am the truth. I am the life. No one comes to the father except through me. Now, these words are probably the most controversial words I think Jesus has ever said in, in all of the words that he's ever said. These words are very controversial. And you know that because uh, I'm going to share a story with you. But, but these words are, are usually the words that we use and have said that, that leave people with a certain um, experience. And, it's, and this, these words are either left with someone thinking these are controversial words or are these words of comfort? So how do you hear these words? I am the way, the truth, the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. How do you hear these words? Are these controversial words for you? 
where you think Jesus is being exclusive, narrow-minded about how we get to heaven? Or are you finding these words as comfort of how to get to heaven? These words are also possibly an indictment on people who don't want to come through Jesus. But what Jesus is saying is something of an invitation to come to heaven through him. Jesus sounds like he's being judgmental, but in reality, he's speaking and he's being joyful about what he's saying. When Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, the life, he's being, he's inviting his disciples. He's having joy and in inviting them, and they're supposed to bring comfort to them. But it's a question of how do you hear these words? Because if you're like me, before I got saved, I remember I was searching for God, but I, I didn't know Christ and I didn't surrender to him. And I remember I was wrestling because I just had a really rough time believing that, that how, can, how can Jesus be the only way? Like, honestly, how, can, how narrow-minded is that to say something like that? So I remember being in my room in my teens, like reading scripture, and I didn't know anything about how to read scripture, but I just happened to read John chapter 14, and I'm sharing with this you so you know that I didn't always accept these words. So I understand if there's someone here or someone watching online that just has a rough time with these words. I get it, because I did. Because I was like, I just, I don't get it, I don't know. And I'm like really trying to figure out what Jesus said. And I remember reading John chapter 14, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And I literally did this. I am not exaggerating when I say this. I literally went like this. That ain't true. I can't accept that. There's no way that you're the only way. I, I can't accept that. Now, if you're like me, you're probably thinking, how are you breathing right now, Pastor Eric? You should have been zapped by lightning, right? You denied Jesus? Yes, I did. I was not surrendered to him, and I had a rough time accepting Jesus' word. I hated Jesus in this moment, but I also was terrorized by Jesus in this moment because I couldn't see the invitation of heaven. I only saw it as an indictment. I only saw it as judgment. I only saw it as controversial I couldn't see the joy of what Jesus was trying to tell his disciples. I could not see the invitation. I could not see the comfort that he's giving to people because that is his heart. That's what these words really are saying. It's a comfort, an invitation, joy of Jesus proclaiming, I am the way, I am the truth, I am the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. And you can know that you know the Father because you know me. This is what Jesus is saying. And I know a lot of people will say, um, um, they'll, they'll be thinking, um, you know, how, how can we know that Jesus is the way? How can we be assured of this? Well, the word way in the Greek is, I want to kind of break down these three words because Jesus claims to be these three things. He doesn't just say I'm the way. He says I'm the way, the truth, the life. And what are these three words in the Greek, so we can understand them now. He says, I am the way, and this is the Greek word hodos, okay? And hodos means a literal pathway or road, like a literal pathway or road, but it can also metaphorically be understanding as a conduct or a way of living your life. So like Paul uses this word hodos in the Greek when he's telling the church in Corinth, uh, he's telling them about how to use their spiritual gifts in the context of the church. And then he tells them, okay, now that you know how to use your gifts, he goes in verse uh, 1 Corinthians 12, 31, if you're making notes, and if you take notes, you get extra credit in heaven. He says, now eagerly desire the greater gifts, as he's telling them how to use their gifts. Then he says, and yet I will show you the most excellent way. So you see he uses the word hodos there, but he's not talking about a literal pathway. He's saying, I will show you in the way that you are, to, or the conduct in which you are to use your gifts. And here Jesus is using that in both senses. He's literally the road to heaven, but he's also saying this is the way of heaven. This is the way that you can know you're going to heaven. There's a way of life that you are to live, and it's through me. This is kind of understood if you, uh, I don't know if any of you like Star Wars. How many of you like Star Wars? Raise your hand if you like Star Wars. Okay, some of you I can see don't like Star Wars. You've never, you have no idea. You're probably thinking I'm a big geek right now. Okay, uh, in, in one of the greatest Star Wars stories that is currently going on right now, it's called The Mandalorian, okay? 
You probably heard that. Maybe you've never watched it, but you've heard of it. And one of the key things that's said throughout the story that, that is, that's pretty awesome is that there's this, this way that's being used in the same way that we're talking about the way as a conduct of life. Uh, the Mandalorian are these group of people, and they're not, they're sworn, once you become a Mandalorian, you cannot take off your helmet. So it's like a religious thing. They can't take off their helmet. And one of the things that they say when they're all in agreement about the way they are to do something, they all say, this is the way. So you probably heard that. You've probably seen a meme where you see uh, Din Djarin, who is the, the main character, the Mandalorian, and he'll always know for saying, when he's looking at another Mandalorian, he'll say, this is the way. Everybody turn to your neighbor, turn to your neighbor right now, and everybody say, this is the way. Come on now, y'all say it, say it with some power in your voice. This is the way. This is the way. This is what, and, and this is the way that Jesus is saying. Jesus is literally saying to disciples, this is the way. Right here. He's pointing to himself. This is the way. You're asking about where the way is. This is the way. This is the way we do this. So Jesus is the way. Now, the first point I want to make for today is that Jesus is the road to God in heaven for us. So he is the road of God in heaven for us. So if you want to know the road, Jesus is like, I'm the road. I'm the path. Not a path, not a road. I am the road, right? Now, I often get lots of people, if you're speaking with people, um, and you're around people who, who don't have necessarily their own personal religious conviction, and I used to say the same thing. I used to believe that all roads lead to God, right? So if you talk to a other people of different faiths or someone who's more like a universalist or someone like that, they'll say this statement, all road leads to God. And I agree with them. I'll be like, you know what? You're right. And Christians should say that they agree, except to add this real crucial point. You should say all roads do lead to God at the judgment. And this is true. All roads of paths of people will lead to God at the judgment. You, you don't have to be a Christian to be at the judgment. It will be Muslims are there, Hindus are there, atheists will be there, agnostics, people who make up their own thing. Uh, you got all kinds of groups at this point. You have atheists, you have deists, you have theists. You have like every, you have people who believe in the spaghetti monster, just to be funny. Whatever it is that you believe. Yeah, all roads lead to the judgment. That's true. But all roads don't lead to heaven. And when I, why, do, why do you say that, Pastor? Well, in Hebrews chapter 9, there's a really important point to be made. In Hebrews 9, it says this. These are four emphatic things that are all considered facts of life from a theological, spiritual standpoint. And it goes like this. In Hebrews chapter 9, the case is being made just as people are destined to die once. So, like, death is certain, right? Ten out of ten people are going to die. That's certain. And the Bible says you're appointed to die. You're destined to die once. So that's, that's coming. I know it's a little more of it, but that's happening, whether you want to or not. You're going to die once. But it doesn't just end there. It says you're destined to die once and then to face the judgment to face judgment one day, to give an account for the life that God gave you because your life is not your own, you're going to face judgment one day. And so you will face God with your life that you lived, and you will have to face a judgment. Now, the point is being made that these are two certain things for everyone, for all mankind. But just like that, there are also, there are also two other certain things that have been done. In the same way, though, it says, so Christ was sacrificed once to take away the sins of many, and he will appear a second time not to bear sin, but to bring salvation to those who are waiting for him. So just like death and judgment are absolutely certain for us, we can also certainly know two other things. Jesus came, he died to take away the sins for the people, for his followers, for those who will trust and believe in him, and he's coming a second time for those who are going to be waiting for him because he is gone to prepare a place for you. This is a certain thing, and this is what Jesus is trying to explain to the disciples. This is the certainty I'm giving you of what I'm doing. 
So Jesus is the road to God in heaven, but only one road leads to God in heaven. All roads lead to the judgment, but not all roads lead to heaven, which is where you will live forever with God as Father. I'm going to touch more on this point in just a few minutes, but there's only one man who knows the road to heaven as well. You have to be from heaven to know how to get there. What do I mean? Well, there's a story about a traveler, and I want to tell you this story real quick to kind of illustrate this point. A man traveling in an unfamiliar territory came to a place where he had to cross some very high mountains. Knowing it would be difficult, he looked for a qualified guide, and when one man offered his services, the traveler asked him, have you ever been to the village where I want to go? That was his question. Have you ever been to the place where I want to go? And the man said, no. But I've been a part of the way, and I've been told how to proceed from there. The traveler answered, I'm sorry, but you won't do. Why? Because he's never been to that place before. There's no certainty of what the man's saying. Then another volunteered, and he too asked, have you ever been to that town that I'm trying to go to? And the man said, no, but I've been to the top of the mountain and looked down on the road that leads to it. And the man replied, I'm afraid that despite the knowledge you have, I wouldn't dare trust myself to your leading. Finally, a third man said that he knew the way perfectly. And the man asked him, he, when he asked the same question, have you been to that village? He exclaimed, sir, the village where you are going is my home. The traveler knew immediately that this was the guide that he needed. If you want to go to heaven, you need to know someone who's from heaven, who is, claims to be from heaven. In fact, I'll go on to say, this person it has to be his home. And that's what Jesus is telling his disciples right now. Heaven is my home. I came from there. I'm going back there. And I'm making a way for you to get there. And the only way to there is through me. Because it's my home. Heaven is our home if we trust in Christ. And so Jesus claims to be the one road to heaven. He, and there's so many Bible verses that explain this, but... 1 Timothy 2.5 says, For there is one God and one mediator between God and mankind, the man Christ Jesus. There's one person who represents God to us and us to God. Acts 4.12, Salvation is found in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given to mankind by which we must be saved, and that is except the name of Jesus. That is the one that God has given us to be saved. But how can we know that Jesus is the way? Well, Jesus goes on to say, I'm the way. So everybody say there's something for your voice. Everybody say, Jesus is the way. He's the way. But how do we know he's the way? Because Jesus goes on to add, I'm the truth. And this word in the Greek is aletheia. And aletheia basically means, it literally means a true to the fact. It is the direct opposite in its definition to being fictitious, fake, or false. The direct opposite. So the idea of something being fake, fictitious, or false, meaning that it's not real, truth, aletheia, is the fact. Jesus is saying, I am the fact of God. I am a fact. I am the truth. So Jesus is the truth, and, and what are we saying? That Jesus is saying here, Jesus is the reality of God in heaven to us. So while Jesus is the road, he says that because he's saying, I'm also the reality of God to us. And how do we know that? Because later on, Jesus says to his disciples, if you know me, you know my father. So Jesus makes his point to say, if you've seen me, you've seen the father. In fact, he goes on, you know the father because you know me. He makes it certain for them to know that because they're like, I don't, we don't know if we know God. He goes, no, you know God because you know me. So in direct relationship of you, if you know me, you know God. And he says, you know God because you know me. This is the direct correction because what is Jesus saying? I am the reality of God in heaven to us. How do you want to know God? 
You want to know God? Jesus. This is literally what Christianity is about. We're not here to debate religion. We're not here to compare. We're telling people, hey, God has already come here. And I, I want to give you a story from a famous missionary and pastor now, author David Platt, and his book, Radical. He t- this is a real story. And, and it, this story always stuck with me. And this story was when he was having a conversation with two spiritual leaders. It says, David Platt told a story about what happened to him when he was standing outside the Buddhist temple in Indonesia. As he stood there, he got into a conversation with two people, a Buddhist leader and a Muslim leader. Both of them embraced what was seemed to be a very reasonable belief. They believed that while there were superficial differences among their major religions, all of them basically taught the same thing. When they asked David Platt what he thought, he said, it sounds as though you both picture God at the top of the mountain. It seems as if you believe that we are all at the bottom of the mountain and I may take one route to the mountain and you may take another, but in the end, we all end up in the same place. So he's asking that to the leaders and and they say, they both said, exactly, you understand what we're saying. To which Platt replied back, but he leaned in and said, now let me ask you a question. What would you think if I told you that the God at the top of the mountain actually came down to where we are? What would you think if I told you that God doesn't wait for people to find their way to him, but instead he comes to us? They both thought for a moment and then replied, that would be great. And then David Platt replied, let me introduce you to Jesus. Because that's the whole point. This ain't a mission for you to come to God. The mission is that God has come to us. This is why we take these words, the way, the truth, the life. We're not here to debate and argue with people. We're here to be on mission. This is our mission. If someone doesn't know Jesus, it's not for us to argue with God and say, well, how can those people know you, Jesus? Jesus will say, I already told you I'm the way, the truth, the life. Go to those people and tell them. That's, this, is what, this is what we have to do. We're not here to read Jesus' words and think that they're judgment against us. They're an invitation for all people to know him. Because people don't see God. People are not genuinely seeking after him. The, the point I'm trying to make to you is, yes, all people in the world, they're spiritual people, and they are like have their relationship with God, but it, they're not actually seeking to know the one true God. For a lot of us, the Bible explains to us, we've all fallen short of God's glory. And he goes on to say, no one seeks God. No one seeks him. And we have to kind of wrestle because we, we think that people are seeking him. And, and what God shows us is, no, you're not, they're not seeking me. They're seeking a spiritual experience to satisfy their conscience that they think they know. But God makes it clear, no, 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 people, people don't know me. But God makes it certain that if people do seek him, the Bible always continuously says, and God speaks to his people, if you seek me, you will find me. So he makes it absolutely certain because God is on a mission to reveal himself. That's why Jesus came. We don't have to go up the mountain. The man on the mountain already came down to us. He's already here. And our mission is, is to tell everybody that. And if, it, if you die for saying that, you die. If you're persecuted for saying that, you're persecuted. But it doesn't change what the man did to come down the mountain. Jesus came from heaven to come and tell us what heaven is like and to make a way for us to go to heaven. That's the whole thing. That's what we're doing. It's very simple. We're not here to argue. We're here to proclaim and be on mission. This is an invitation for all to come. Jesus is the way. Jesus is the truth. Jesus is the life. He is the Aletheia. And he goes on to say, no one comes to the Father except through me. If you really know me, you will know my Father as well. From now on, you do know him and have seen him. Why? Because Jesus is the full revelation of the Father to us. Hebrews chapter 1, verse 1 through 3, if you're making a note, read this with me. He says, long ago, God spoke many times in many ways to our ancestors through the prophets. And now in these final days, 
He has spoken to us through his son. God promised everything to the son as an inheritance. And through the son, he created the universe. I want to stop and read that again. Through the son, he created the universe. When you look at the universe, you need to, what, it's beautiful, it's amazing, it's wonderful. But one thing that should stick to you is that this was all made for Jesus. It says, everything the Son has inheritance, through him he created the universe. The, the Son, the Son radiates God's own glory and expresses the very character of God, and he sustains everything by the mighty power of his command. And how can Jesus do that? Because Jesus says, I am the way, I am the truth. Everybody say this with me, the life. We talked about this two weeks ago, but for those who are not here, the life that Jesus is talking about, there are three words in the Greek for life, okay? The first one we talked about is bios. That literally is physical life. It's like you and I are here. We see animals. We see the, the Discovery Channel, and we're like so wowed at like all the animals and what they do, and, and we see physical life, and we're even defending bios life because we're destroying it in many ways, right? So there's just all these things going on, and we're, we're so caught up about bios, and bios is important, but bios is just the physical life of things, where we get the word biology, right? But there's a second word, suke, and suke is talking about the life of the soul. This is where the Bible says that God breathed into Adam, the first human, and he gave him a soul. He was, it was a suke that he came to life. So Jesus talks about this idea of suke when he says uh, anyone who holds on to their life will lose it. Right? He's talking about your suke, your soul. If you hold on to your soul, you'll lose it. But if you, if you lose your soul, you'll find it. You'll keep it. You'll preserve it. And that's a different way of life. There's a third word for life, and that's the word life, zoe. Now, zoe life is different than bios and suke because bios and suke work within space and time. Zoe life is outside of space and time. This is the God kind of life. It's, it's the life that God allows him to be self-existent, beyond and outside of all things. Like when, I, when, when we see the beginning of the Bible saying God created the heaven and the earth, the, the reason why we know that God was not created is because he creates. He's outside of space and time. That's Zoe life. And that life is the life that's uncreated. It's incorruptible and it's unending. It's what we mean by eternal life, that Jesus, when Jesus says, I came to give you eternal life, he's saying, I came to give you Zoe. This is the promise to you that you would share and receive Zoe life, that you would participate with Zoe life. This is what God plans to do when he raises you from the dead. How can Jesus raise people from the dead? Because he is Zoe life. This is the power of that he has, the, the way that he is able to keep everything and sustain all things is because he is Zoe, life. And he gives this promise to his disciples. So the last point, Jesus is the road to heaven. Jesus is the reality of heaven. And the last point for today is that Jesus is the resurrection of God in heaven in us. Why do I say that? Because Jesus, after a couple of verses of him explaining to be in his father's house, he says in verse 9, chapter 14, verse 9, he says, Before long, the world will not see me anymore, but you will see me. What does he mean? He says, Because I live, you also will live. You also will live because he lives. And I'm sure the disciples were a little like, What are you talking about, Jesus? What do you mean by that? But they'll realize that as he's resurrected from the dead and he has the power to raise himself from the dead, this same power he's now promising to do for them. Last place I told you to end with is John chapter 5. And again, we read this last time I was here, but I want us to read this again because this goes over all the things Jesus had claimed about himself. So in John chapter 5, he says in verse 21, for just as the Father raises the dead and gives them life, even so the Son gives life to whom he is pleased to give it. So Jesus is equivalenting himself. The Father has the life and power to do that. So do I. Verse 22. Moreover, the Father judges no one, 
but has entrusted all judgment to the Son. Verse 23, that all may honor the Son just as they honor the Father. Whoever does not honor the Son does not honor the Father who sent him. Verily, truly, I tell you, whoever hears my word and believes him who sent me has Zoe life, has eternal life. It's yours. If you believe the Father sent the Son, eternal life is yours. That's what Jesus is saying. Now, he's not saying this in a private meeting. He's saying this to everybody out loud in a, in a crowd. And then he goes on to say, and you will not be judged but will, has crossed over from death to life. So what Jesus is saying is, all roads lead to God at the judgment, and I'm the judge. God's not going to be the one to judge. He's handed all judgment to the Son. And everyone's going to stand there. And, but Jesus says, but if you believe in me, you cross over from the judgment into heaven. Because Jesus is the judge of the living and the dead. And the question this morning is, are you living? Because if you're not in Christ, you're dead in your sins. Your sins already have a debt to be paid, and that is death. Jesus goes on to say, Verily, truly, I tell you, a time is coming and has now come when the dead will hear the voice of the Son of God, and those who hear will live. How do you hear his words? Do you hear them as an invitation? Do you hear them as joy? Do you see them as comfort? Because if you do, you will live. You will partake in the Zoe life. For as the Father has life in himself, so he has granted the Son also to have life in himself. That word life is Zoe. And he has given him authority to judge because he is the Son of Man. Do not be amazed at this, for a time is coming when all who are in the graves will hear his voice and come out. Those who have done what is good will rise to live, and those who have done what is evil will rise to be condemned. And what is Jesus saying? Let me put it to you in plain language, okay? Jesus is telling his disciples, Jesus is telling all of us today, I have gone to prepare a place for you in my father's house. My father's house is a place of air conditioning. Heaven is a place of joy, peace, and there's one way to get it. You want to go to this house? You got to know the guy who belong, whose house it is. This is my house. This is my father's house. I'm going there. If you want a place to be in air conditioning, this is the way. If you don't come this way, then you're going to be in a place where there's no air conditioning. If you catch my drift, no pun intended. Either you want to come to God's house as an invitation where you can be part of his family. This is what Jesus is inviting his disciples to. This is what Jesus is inviting all of us to. And Jesus is basically saying to disciples, and this is the, the last question that I want to give for someone and, and for all of us to be invited to this morning, to invited to respond to. Do you want to be fathered by God? This is the invitation for his disciples. He's saying, listen, in my father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, I wouldn't have told you. And I'm going there to prepare a place for you. And I am the way that you get to that house. I'm the, the truth about that house. I'm the life that you're going to find from that house. And that, and that is that what Christ was always doing all throughout his life, he was teaching his disciples the way of the Father. He was always talking about the Father. Like Jesus would obsessively always talk about the Father. So his disciples would understand that if you come to him, you believe in him, you now are fathered by God. And this is what God's desire is for us. This is what it means to be a Christian, to be fathered by the Most High God. 
That's the only way out of sin. That's the only way to have forgiveness. That's the only way to have healing in your life. That's the only certainty that you can know what happens after the judgment, that you would make it beyond that, that you would cross over. Jesus is saying you must be fathered by God. And he has sent his son to invite you into that. That's why when we receive the Holy Spirit, what the Holy Spirit is doing in you is he's fathering you and preparing you for the place that Jesus has prepared for you. And this is what Christianity is about. It's not us versus them. This is us telling everyone, you must be fathered by God. That is what God has made you for. Everything's made for the Son, and the Son is made so that all things are called and invited to be fathered. But if you don't want to be fathered, there's nothing else. There's no other plan. There's no, there's no other place to go. It's just for you to be left in sin in your own way of living. As I tell people, if you're not a Christian, if you're not a believer in Christ, if you won't be fathered by God, this is the closest to heaven you're ever going to get. So you might as well live it up. Because after this life, it's only down. But if you're a Christian, if you choose to be fathered by God, if you will come to Christ and you will take him at his word, this is the closest to hell you're ever going to get. This is it. This is, so you might go through some stuff in this life. It may feel like hell. And somebody raise your hand now. You know we've gone through some hell in this life. Raise your hand and be a testimony if you feel like sometimes you're going through hell in this life. But understand, this is the closest you're ever going to get. This, this is, I don't know why anybody's not dancing right now. Like, I don't know how you're not dancing. This is it. Like, you have your certainty to know it's up from here. Like, you might go through the crappiest part of your life. You might be going through something really rough, and it might be tough, but you have certainty to know Jesus said, prepare a place for me. And because he sits at the right hand of the Father, I can trust and know with certainty as he made it to his disciples, you know me, you know God because you know Christ. And though this life is temporary, you know that you're going to live forever and eternity with him because this is the promise that he gave to us. This is what he died on the cross. This is why he came and rose from the dead. This is why he ascended and sits at the right hand of the Father for you. Please understand. We celebrate our Lord this morning because this is what he's always, this is, what, this is why we get hype on mission. This is why we tell everyone to come to here for Easter. But even if they don't come here for Easter, you go and tell people about Easter. This is our message. This is the hope that we have. So this morning, and this last time as we sing, as we prepare ourselves for communion, if you've never given your life to Jesus, if you're still like there on that on that edge and you're not sure like I was you sat there and you're just like that can't be true thank God Jesus was not done with me in that moment Jesus didn't stand and hear me complain and be unsure of what he said Jesus pursued me in that moment that's why I remember it because in that moment I denied Jesus but Jesus did not deny me he pursued me he pursued me so I would understand the invitation. So when I see these words now, they give me hype. I'm like, yo, he's the way. He's the truth. He's the life. I have absolute certainty of knowing where I'm going. Because these words are no longer a controversy for me. They're comfort. They're no longer an indictment. They're an invitation. They're no longer judgment. They are joy for me in my life. Come on. It's, what, it's how you hear change your mind change your hearing understand that there's a promise being made yeah. and you can come to the father's house because yeah. there's lots of room there is so much room in God's house and he wants you to be family and so this morning if you've never given your life to Christ I want to give you the opportunity to do so now if you if you just pray with me and and for those who are Christian already you've already given your life to Christ just pray with me as well Let's just pray this prayer, and then we're going to sing a song together and, and worship Jesus. Say these words. Father, I surrender my life to you. I've lived my life in sin without you. I've lived for myself, and I'm tired. 
I need you. Thank you for the cross. Thank you for the resurrection. Thank you for sending your son. I surrender my life to Jesus. I give you my life. Give me your spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. And if that's you, if you gave your life to Christ this moment, if you've surrendered your life, please don't leave here. Like, there's, we have things for you. We want to pray with you still. But I want to give you an opportunity to know that you, if you've surrendered your life to Christ, you're, by you truly surrendering, you can partake in the body. The body and the blood is for you. It's why Jesus said, my body was broken for you. My blood is poured out. So let's stand together as we worship Jesus. Till from heaven